the traditional learning objectives. And then here are the learning objectives Cleveland style. So I'm, I'll neither read these nor sing them, but you can stare at them for a little bit, see if I've gone crazy or try to match this up to each biologic. All right, so here's a question to wake you up. The Cleveland Cavaliers had a losing record. They were 24 and 58. What else has had a losing record? What's that? Hepatitis. <laughs> All right, lupus clinical trials. We've had three wins. The two pivotal phase three trials for belimumab and then the alms maintenance trials. So a little bit more on this later. We need better therapies for lupus, no question about that. And at the top of the list is lupus nephritis. Depends how you define a good response. But generally, if we hit 25 to say 35% of patients having a good response, we're lucky. So we need better drugs for lupus nephritis. We need for extra renal disease. We need to prevent damage from this disease. And we certainly need to prevent damage from the drugs we use to treat the disease. Think about the havoc that is wreaked with the steroids, the cataracts, the osteonecrosis, the osteoporosis, and the cardiovascular disease. And then on the wish list, remission induction. But lupus is a real tough nut to crack. And that's because of the heterogeneity of the manifestations. And not that we have a whole lot of background medicines that we use, but there's confounding by steroids and immunosuppressives. And for anybody who's been to a lupus ad board, I mean, it's a nightmare. It's uh, you know, a lot of argument about how to handle steroids in these trials. And though we've made a little progress with trial endpoints, there's still a lot to be desired. But what's so amazing to me is despite these challenges, there's unprecedented lupus activity right now as far as clinical trials go. All right, so a little bit of background. The innate immune system versus the adaptive immune system. So remember that the innate immune system consists of nonspecific responses, not sustained at all. This is a very ancient system found in all plant and animal life. And examples of the innate immune system would be complement, neutrophils, toll-like receptors. The adaptive immune system, on the other hand, is very advanced. Antigen-specific responses, there's a memory to mount stronger and stronger responses found in vertebrates only. And examples would be B lymphocytes, T lymphocytes, and antibodies. Now, this is somewhat simplistic, but this is my rendition of the pathogenesis of lupus. And on the bottom left, the adaptive immune system, the top right, the innate immune system. So in, an, in a genetically susceptible host, there's some type of environmental trigger. And I have the sun as the trigger, causing apoptosis of skin cells with release of DNA and RNA, in this case DNA, binding to toll-like receptor 9 in the plasmacytoid dendritic cell. And the consequence of that is the synthesis of a bunch of different cytokines, chief of which is interferon alpha. And all of these cytokines have the uh, capability of stimulating cells in the adaptive immune system. So we'll cross over to the other side with T cells, myeloid dendritic cells, and of course B cells. B cells and T cells interact through the T cell receptor and the MHC, and then there are co-stimulatory molecules. So each of these molecules or cells that I'm showing you are potential targets for lupus treatment. And most of them have already been targeted and some will be targeted in the future. B cells are dependent upon two cytokines, April and BLIS. BLIS stands for B lymphocyte stimulator for growth and differentiation. They can differentiate into plasma cells which spew out antibodies and in the case of lupus, anti-DNA antibodies and DNA antibodies complex with DNA to, and can further activate components of the innate immune system, complement attracting neutrophils and these complex, complexes activating macrophages. And then the whole cycle is perpetuated, in this case, immune complexes binding FC receptor on plasma cytoid dendritic cells. B cells are certainly an appropriate target in lupus. 
There are a lot of different ways one can target B cells, but I'm just going to discuss right now anti-CD20 and anti-CD22. So the pre-study expectations with rituximab and ocrelizumab were so high, and that was based upon the off-label experience and the open-label studies. And we thought it would just be a formality to do a couple studies with rituximab and lupus and get an approval. Well, it wasn't so easy. There was the Explorer trial, which was an extra renal study. It failed. There was a lunar trial looking at lupus nephritis, proliferative lupus nephritis. That failed as well. And then with ocrelizumab, basically a second generation anti-CD20, that study failed, but in fact it was prematurely terminated because of opportunistic infections in Asia. So three trials, all failures. But is B-cell depletion therapy dead? Clinicians still believe. So if one looks at the LUNAR trial and focuses not at week 52, which was the primary endpoint, but at week 78, there was a statistically significant reduction in proteinuria. And I think also compelling is that there were fewer rescues in the treatment group as opposed to the placebo group. So that is rescues with cyclophosphamide. There were eight out of 72 in the placebo group and zero in the treatment group. And the effect size, which was around 11%, is no different than what got belimumab approved. The difference being, in Lunar, there were 72 patients per arm. In the belimumab trials, 270 patients per arm. But rituximab clearly remains in our toolbox. I use it for autoimmune cytopenias. I use it for refractory nephritis. Some are using it for CNS disease. So the interest remains quite high. There are nephritis studies ongoing in England, and there are nephritis studies that are being planned in Europe. Will companies pursue an indication in lupus? I don't know the answer to that. All right, switching to another target, and that is CD22. CD22 is restricted to B cells. It has adhesive functions. It also restricts B cell signaling. When one gives epituzumab, anti-CD22, one sees partial B cell depletion, about a 40% reduction in B cells. The phase 2B emblem study was somewhat remarkable in that the endpoint was reached at week 12. It was a dose-ranging study, and it used a very rigorous composite endpoint called the BICLA. So we'll see what happens in phase 3, which is well underway at this point in time. Another way to approach lupus is to inhibit T and B cell interactions. And there are many different types of interactions between T cells and B cells, but what I've highlighted is CD80 and CD86, and then CD28 and CTLA4 on the T cell. The drug you know, that's abatacept, it's CTLA4 IG that binds CD80, 86, preventing those molecules from activating T cells. Long time ago, studies were done in murine lupus, and CTLA-4-IG was quite effective in turning off lupus nephritis. So it made sense to use this drug in lupus. There were several clinical trials, one an extra-renal trial, basically a flare prevention trial, which was unsuccessful. We've been living off post hoc analyses in lupus for a long time, and in fact, in this post hoc analysis, there seemed to be a modest effect of abatacept in preventing bilag A flares. There were two trials done in lupus nephritis. One I presented about a year and a half ago at the ACR meeting. This was given on a background of MMF. It was an unsuccessful trial. And you'll hear about data fairly soon about this same drug, abatacept, on a background of urolupus cyclophosphamide. <clears throat> so more about abatacept on the background of MMF. The primary endpoint was the time to confirm complete renal response. And you'll notice two things about this graph. So number one is that the curve superimposed. There were two different treatment arms versus one placebo arm. Results all about the same. And the results show very low response rates in the teens. It gets even worse. If one just looks at the secondary endpoint, 
complete renal response at the end of the study at months 11 and 12. So it had to be confirmed at the last two visits. You're looking at low single digit response rates. So why is that? There are a lot of design issues. When these studies fail in lupus, the big question is, is it the drug or is it the designer? And in a lot of cases, it's the design and the designers. So for this particular study, entry criteria required a protein creatinine ratio of 0.44 or greater. So that's relatively low for a lupus nephritis trial. But that was not the big problem with this study. The big problem was the endpoint. In order to be considered a responder, one had to have a protein creatinine ratio at the end of the study of less than 0.26. And that's pretty harsh. Generally, our endpoints are about 0.5. But more important than that was the GFR had to be within 10% of baseline. And that means either way. So patients who improved their GFR more than 10% from baseline were considered responders. Yes, you are hearing that correctly. So if one went up to 115% improvement over baseline, they were considered a non-responder, and that could not be changed by the FDA. And then the third thing is that confirmation was required one month after the original response. So the first thing to do with this failed study is modify the endpoints. Just look at week 52, not require confirmation, and you'll see CR. Uh, roughly about the same, regardless of whether you were in the high or low treatment group or placebo. But focusing on the revised complete response, and revised means forget about that 10% either way. Don't exclude patients from being a responder if they had improvement in GFR. And you start to see some signals that the drug may actually be working. And then David Wafsey published using the LUNAR, the rituximab trial criteria, and you see perhaps even stronger signals that maybe abatacept does have an effect in lupus nephritis. All right, now to turn to soluble targets, and I want to focus on interferon alpha and B lymphocyte stimulator. There are three different types of interferons, type 1, type 2, and type 3. Type 1 includes a variety of different interferons, chief of which is alpha interferon, and all of these type 1 interferons bind a single receptor, the type 1 interferon alpha receptor. Type 2 consists of interferon gamma, and then there's type 3, and type 2 binds yet a different receptor than the type 1 interferons. There was a lot of biology that also turned into a lot of hype. We were very excited because Lupus patients have elevated interferon alpha levels. Their sera produces interferon gene signatures. In fact, about 60 to 70 percent of patients will themselves have interferon gene signatures. And it was shown that disease activity by SLEDI actually correlated with interferon gene expression. And in some of the early studies, antibodies to interferon alpha actually reduced gene expression. So the big question was, if you inhibit interferon alpha, could you reduce disease activity? Well, there are different approaches to inhibiting interferon alpha. One can take an antibody to interferon alpha, and there are three in trials. There's cifalimumab, rontalizumab, and AGS-009. So these only inhibit interferon alpha. This has been tried in myositis. The data have not been released, and I'll tell you a little bit about the lupus results. The other approach is to use an antibody to the receptor itself, and therefore block more than just interferon alpha, but all the other type 1 interferons. And the antibody is MEDI-546. This has been studied in scleroderma, data released at the ACR meeting uh, last fall, and in lupus. So where do we stand with results from interferon alpha inhibition? The results of the cifalibumab phase 1b trial showed no differences in the SLEDI or BILAG, our typical disease activity measurements, cifalibumab versus placebo. There was only about a 35% inhibition of the interferon alpha signature. 
and this was in the interferon high subjects. A phase 2B study has completed enrollment, and we hopefully will hear about results over the next 6 to 12 months. Another approach using the same strategy, and that is an antibody to the cytokine itself, is rontolizumab, and these data were presented at the last ACR meeting. Again, no clinical activity. We haven't heard about the biology. We don't know how much inhibition of the interferon signature took place. The most I can tell you is that in an exploratory analysis of the interferon low patients, so at study outset, about two-thirds of the patients had an interferon high signature, and one-third had low amounts of interferon signature activity. There was a reduction in disease activity in the interferon low patients, which is kind of counter to what one would expect. You would think if the drug's going to work, it's going to work in someone who has interferon high signature, unless we're just talking about a dose effect. But what really intrigues me is MEDI 546, because if one of the potential problems to clinical efficacy is that we're not inhibiting the signature, then maybe we need to take a different approach. And remember, MEDI 546 inhibits the type 1 receptor. And in the scleroderma trial, it was shown that there was very significant reduction in interferon gene signatures. But scleroderma is clearly a different disease than lupus. So the phase two study with MEDI 546 is currently underway. So can the interferon signature be neutralized? Well, we've seen 35%. That may not be enough to see a clinical effect. Does neutralization result in clinical benefit? Well, we haven't seen it yet. And what do we do with signature negative patients? Will they benefit from neutralization? Well, we didn't think so going into this, but now we're seeing some preliminary data from rontolizumab that maybe that, in fact, is the case. But I think the key question here is, what is the better target? Is it the cytokine or the receptor? And then, of course, looming above all this is the safety of interferon neutralization. Switching gears. One way to target B cells is to inhibit the growth factors, targeting BLIS, B lymphocyte stimulator. As mentioned, BLIS is crucial to B cell maturation and differentiation. Murine models showed efficacy when BLIS was inhibited, and there were longitudinal studies in lupus showing that elevated levels of BLIS were predictive of flares. So it certainly justified using a BLIS inhibitor in people. Now, there are different ways to inhibit bliss. And in this cartoon, you see bliss and April binding different receptors. There are three receptors on B cells. Bliss primarily binds bliss receptor, but can also bind the other two, tachy and BCMA, where the other growth factor, April, binds tachy and BCMA only. So different approaches include using a soluble receptor, such as tachy, which binds both bliss and April, or using a peptibody that binds bliss. But there are two antibodies out there that bind bliss, tabalimumab and bulimumab. And bulimumab, as you well know, achieved success in two studies and got an approval. We did the typical phase one and phase two studies. What came out of the phase two studies with bulimumab signals in a subset of patients with serologic activity and one other important thing that came out of a post hoc analysis was a responder index. As mentioned at the outset, we have trouble with our endpoints in lupus clinical trials, but this was applied post hoc to the phase two data. A responder was considered a responder if the patient had a four point reduction in the Selena Sledi score, no worsening using another disease activity in instrument, the BILAG and had no worsening in the physician global assessment. So all three criteria had to be met in order to be a responder. So this was certainly applied post hoc to the phase two data and showed success, but going forward, this was accepted by the regulatory agencies as the endpoint for the two pivotal phase three studies. And here are the top line data from the two phase three studies. And you basically see success with both the low dose and the high dose on the left in the BLIS-52 trial. 
And in the Bliss 76, the high dose 10 milligrams per kilogram outperformed placebo. So two successful trials. This was a uh, unprecedented event. We have not had successful lupus trials, and here you had two. So the end result was FDA approval of belimumab in March of 2011, a successful endpoint. I'm not saying that this is the best endpoint, but it's a start. And if you go back uh, probably about 12 to 13 years ago, or even more than that, we were wrestling with endpoints in rheumatoid arthritis. So this is a, at least the start. So favorable effects were not only seen on disease activity reduction, but on steroid tapering, on the SF36, on fatigue, on flare rates, and on serologies. We've also shown that patients with higher disease activity seem to do better with this particular approach. The drug has a favorable safety profile. A lot of patients were entered in the phase three trial, about 16 to 1,700 patients. So there's a very robust database, and you'll see papers still coming out do, uh, showing additional analyses. And in fact, there are more studies underway looking at lupus nephritis, looking at the African-American population, and looking at kids. But there's still a lot of questions about belimumab. And I don't have time to go through all these questions. Maybe this is something we could do in the workshop. But I think there are a lot of questions that clinicians have about who is the best patient, how long do you give the drug, uh, what if the drug works, how long do you continue, and so forth. So I just want to finish up with the ALMS study. And the ALMS study was really tangled up with a lot of red tape. Basically, the question being asked was, is mycophenolate equal to our standard of care cyclophosphamide in lupus nephritis? The feeling being that mycophenolate is a safer drug than cyclophosphamide. And if we showed equivalence, there would be acceptance of MMF. Well, the FDA doesn't work that way. The FDA said, even though cyclophosphamide may represent standard of care, it is not approved. Therefore, the rule is, if your comparator is not FDA approved, you have to show superiority. Equivalence is not enough. So the study, as you can see on the left, showed equivalence between MMF and cyclophosphamide. So it reinforced what we knew, that MMF was probably a good drug for, for lupus nephritis. But it was not superior, therefore no approval for MMF for lupus nephritis. The second phase of the study was a maintenance trial, where MMF actually outperformed azathioprine. So there's a lot of activity in lupus. And here's a list of all the targets or drugs. And one of the big problems is there are far many more studies than there are patients to participate in these particular studies. I'm not sure how we'll overcome that. But you see the list, a lot of interesting biology. So it's the era of lupus, no question about that. Thank you. <laughs>